Well, one of the most important things for my future career happened to me when I was 13 years old. My maternal grandparents bought me a television set and I took advantage. I watched a lot of TV, including The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson just about every night. So you can imagine my joy in discovering something called the Carson Podcast. Mark Malkoff is host and creator of the Carson Podcast and he joins us now for a chat. Mark, it's so good to meet you. How are you doing? Oh, it's great to talk to you. This is fun. I don't really get to talk to that many people. I, I hear from people all the time that miss Carson, but to actually connect with somebody, this is wonderful. Well, I'm one of those guys who misses Carson, because as I say, I used to watch it all the time. But, but you look like you're about 15 years younger than me, which <laughs> makes me wonder. No. Like you didn't watch Johnny first, like first time out the gate, did you? I, I think I was five. Um, my dad let me stay up sometimes on Friday nights and it was, it was a party. I mean, it really had this thing where it was just all these cool adults in, in, in suits just being silly. And um, the politics was over my head, but they would do these sketches and they would do vis visual jokes. And it was just one of those things where uh, I just looked forward to it so much. And I had all these questions, even when I was a kid um, about, about Carson. So yeah, started early. I, I think for people who are, you know, closer to your age than my age, we need to sort of set the context here because, you know, Late Night Tonight is it's Stephen Colbert, it's Jimmy Fallon, yeah. it's Trevor Noah, it's Samantha Bee, it's uh, Jimmy Kimmel, it's uh, Conan O'Brien. People need to understand back in the day, it was Johnny. What kind of power did that give him in, to kind of shape show business of the time? Yeah, Johnny's show w was, a, I mean, a bunch of people tried to compete with him, but they couldn't even come close. I mean, the power of The Tonight Show changed people's lives, their careers. People that I didn't even know about that are public figures that told me I don't do interviews, but because it's Carson, I'm doing it. And just the people have cried to me because how much this show uh, changed, changed their lives. And they never were going for the biggest A-list movie star, whoever was cool. They wanted somebody that could sit down and be a good talker and just have fun w w with Carson. So they could book older people. And now it's very much with the bookings are much, very much youth, youth obsessed. But it was one of those things where um, a comedian could, and it happened, do go on The Tonight Show and within 24 hours has a deal um, for his own show and gets their own show. I mean, one of my guests was on um, food stamps, or they were, he was on welfare at least, with, with kids, and um, the next day he had, he had $10,000 in a development deal from CBS, which $10,000 now is a lot, but back then. That's amazing. Um, Johnny was so comfortable on the air. He was so charming. He was so funny. He was a superb entertainer. Even when he flopped, he was funny. Yeah. But the more and more I listen to your podcast, and you've done what? I don't know. Like, you've done over 200 interviews, I think, with, with people associated with the show. Have you not? We're approaching 300, and I kind of oh can't goodness. believe it. That's amazing. Okay. The more and more I listen to, to your podcast, the more I have come to learn that the Johnny we saw on television was not necessarily the Johnny who lived off television. Explain the difference. He was a shy person. I mean, he had talked about it on The Tonight Show um, a lot that he, it was just something about him and definitely in New York he was much more shy and had some other issues but when he got to Burbank in 1972 in California he definitely relaxed more and was more uh, um, approachable with the staff but still he, he, he was really really shy except when he was around his very good friends when he was around his good friends he was the same person that you would see on the Tonight Show he just he was the most famous man in America in uh, one of his assistants said that it was just self-preservation, that he just could not be open with everybody and be regard. And he had to say, he was doing 90 minutes um, up until 80 or 81. He was doing it an hour and 45 minutes in the beginning. So, uh, so um, he had all this energy he had to save. And um, yeah, but when he was with David Steinberg or Newhart or Rickles and they were socially hanging out, he, they, they, they say he was the same Johnny. His sidekick for all those years was Ed McMahon. Did he, did he have a professional relationship with Ed McMahon only, or did it go closer to friendship? They were friends back in the day. When the show first started, and even before the, the Carson uh, Tonight Show and Who Do You Trust, Ed McMahon was, w was a sidekick on that. They definitely would go out um, drinking, ha having dinner. I know when Johnny was having marital problems more than once, he would go to Philadelphia for the weekend to stay at Ed's just to kind of get, get away and have his own space. 
Um, and so he would actually sleep, and Ed's, Ed's um, daughter, Claudia, was like eight or something, and she would sleep on the couch, and he would take over her bedroom. So they, they definitely had their relationship, and like a lot, some relationships, just over time, it became more professional. They would, um, I think, you know, Johnny, like up until the end, would have uh, dinner uh, for Ed's birthday, and apparently the last couple of years, he kind of just didn't want to do it, but felt like he, he had to. But according to Ed McMahon, they were always like really, really good friends. But then again, Johnny didn't have a lot of friends. He did have friends, but it, was, it wasn't that thing. It wasn't the thing where he, he was hanging out with 15 or 20 people. It had to be a small group of people, which is why he didn't like going to parties. He just liked a few people that he knew. And the leader of the NBC orchestra was Doc Severinsen. What was his relationship with him like? They were friends. I mean, they vacationed. They would go to Mexico. Um, yeah, Doc and, and Johnny were, were close up until uh, Johnny passed in, in 2005. I mean, they were going to get together. And Doc is 92. He still is practicing every day in Tennessee. And I've talked to him a bunch of times. And he still, when he talks about Carson and Carson passing away, the emotion is still there. I mean, it was a lot of these Carson staff members told me he was like the, the, the most important person um in their life or like their role model for how how they live um and again a lot of these people the people that say that did not know the carson was portrayed in henry bushkin's book who was his lawyer who johnny fired and uh joan rivers who also it's a very complicated story there's way more to it than what joan rivers said um people would be sh very very surprised why johnny stopped talking to her um but yeah uh, let's pick up on that because uh, a couple of things. I read the Bushkin book and, and truly the guy who Henry Bushkin describes in that book is not the Johnny Carson who appears on your television set and, and charms the heck out of you. This was a, a darker Carson. This was a meaner Carson. Um, you know, Bushkin, to be sure, would have been upset at being fired by Johnny. But from your conversations with other people that knew Johnny Carson, how close do you think Bushkin got to the, to the real off-camera Johnny? They were close, but then again, he totally, um, he did something that was uh, completely disloyal to Johnny. And even, it was really, um, really bad. But the, the uh, people at the Carson camp, people that knew him told me what, what he did. And he essentially, Carson firing him, essentially um, ended his entertainment, his prestige. I mean, he would go into any restaurant, all the celebrities and stuff. And um, when, when he did something to Carson, and if anybody's disloyal to him, that was one thing, if, um, like Joan Rivers, um, if you actually know what happened, he, he would cut them off. Like there was no, he, he was a very sensitive person. If it was real or perceived, um, there, it was done. The relationship was, was absolutely over. But Bushkin, everybody says, has an ax to grind. I'm sure some of the stories are, are true. I know a couple, one or two things that aren't true that um, I did research on. But um, the guy had an ax to grind. So does Wayne Newton, so does, who I tried to talk to. And so does Joan Rivers, but I, not a lot of people. I can't even get um, count on, on two hands or even, um, yeah, like maybe like five people that had problems with him. It's, it's definitely the, the two biggest people are Bushkin and Rivers. And they had a, a megaphone where they, especially Rivers, every interview would say he's an awful, terrible man. And the public just heard that and they started to believe it. Well, Joan Rivers, of course, was his sort of permanent substitute host at a certain point. Uh, and the two of them had a... Uh, from what I hear from your podcast, a great friendship. And then, of course, she got her own late night TV show on Fox to go up against Johnny. And that was the end of things, right? All she needed to do was sit down and, and say, Johnny, I have an opportunity to, to do this. This is the money that they're, they're offering me. And everybody says, and I've studied the guy so much, he, 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 would, have been, he would have been fine with it. Like he didn't, it would have, like with Cavett, yes, I don't want this person to compete against me, but the opportunity was so good. That's all. She had to do, Joan Rivers said she wasn't allowed to, but Barry Diller, the president of Fox, the, the mogul, told me he told Joan, you have to tell him. And um, the fact that she didn't tell him, and then she tried to take multiple staff members, including Johnny's producer, Peter LaSalle, over to Fox with her, and that The Tonight Show was trying, they heard rumors, and then that weekend they were trying, before the Monday press conference, they were calling Joan to try to get in touch with her, and. and her assistants were, were like, oh, we don't know where she is. We think she's here. And she's just totally avoiding everything. And Johnny found out from, uh, he got a call from Brandon Tartikoff, who was the president of the network, um, before Joan could tell him. And just the fact, the way that she, she did all of that, 
And then um, at her press conference, she was, she was saying, oh, and I have better ratings on Mondays than Johnny, which I don't even know if that's true. But somebody that, I mean, he, he basically made her career. Those are her, her words. And they were close. And I, I heard when Carson found out everything, he, he, he cried. I, I mean, I don't know if that's true, but I have good source that he, he wept. I mean, he, he, would, he wouldn't show his emotions a lot, um, but if he was private or with somebody he trusted, the, the emotions would, would, would be there. But he was, he was completely devastated. Hmm. Let's, let's go back to the show itself. There's a moment when every comedian finishes his or her routine where they're wondering, is that it? Or am I going to get invited to go sit on the couch beside Johnny and do a few minutes more? Describe how that went. Oh, it was the biggest thing for every comedian. First of all, to go on the Tonight Show, and then when you were done with your set and the audience is, is uh, applauding, uh, the comedian was instructed to look over to, to Carson. And normally Carson would, would give an, I, I guess you're not, it's not, they would, he would give him the okay sign. Um, and you usually say One good of these stuff things. or something. Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, you do, Carson would do something like that. And if you got the okay sign, that was huge on its own. But once in a while, and it didn't happen a lot, Carson would call the person over to sit down and do what was called panel and actually be a guest and, and talk, which is what every comedian wants. Like Dave Letterman is the only person I know that got called over that it was arranged ahead of time. Very par powerful management. But for the most part, like a Drew Carey, for example, when he got um, called over, and he probably had one of the greatest sets ever. I mean, to talk to Johnny, and he got to do panel. I mean, his life changed um, immediately. Development deals, every agent wanted him. He got his own show. And it was one of those things where when Drew Carey tells the story, he's, he cries. I mean, when he was um, interviewed by, um, for a documentary, he, he just cries. They, they get very, very emotional, the power of the show. And it is one of those things where like Freddie Prince, um, who was a, a big comedian in the 70s and timely and got called over. At, he was 19. I mean, can you imagine being 19? You're, you're doing, um, you're going on Carson, you're doing your comedy and that Sammy Davis Jr. is sitting next to Carson and a big response. And um, you can hear Davis mainly off camera. You can hear Carson and then he gets called over. And then the next day uh, or within like a few days, um, NBC, he has his own sitcom. That doesn't happen anymore, does it? I mean, it doesn't work that way anymore, I don't think. It's, it's just different. Like, um, there are certain shows with certain people. Like, um, it, it, it can definitely get them to, like, um, like steps, but not normally um, night and day. I mean, there's just so many outlets. And back then, that was the only outlet was The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. And to get in good with the booker and to get in good – with, with, with um, Carson and to try to get rebooked and have enough material. Like Billy Crystal and Dave Letterman all had material for at least a few performances when they were asked back. Because there were comedians like Stephen Wright, this other gentleman as well, that were, um, that were called over that were like, we want you next week. And some of these comedians did not, were not prepared for, for, for this, but it was definitely the smart comedians like Seinfeld was writing every single day because uh, he was doing like five Carsons um, a year. I mean, the show absolutely changed his life. He and um, many other comedians say that that is the biggest thrill of their career highlight, no matter what. These are people with sit iconic show sitcoms, these amazing credits. I still say the Carson thing was the, the biggest moment of their career. I don't know why I still remember this, but I, I do remember seeing Stephen Wright on the Carson show maybe 35 or 40 years ago. And he yeah. said at one point, Johnny, it's a small world, but I wouldn't want to paint it. <laughs> yeah, he was, with me. I don't know he, why. He was so different. Peter LaSalle, who's one of the producers who's been on the podcast, happened to be in Boston. Uh, his, uh, his daughter was looking at colleges and Peter never did this, but he's like, I want to come into a stand-up, uh, see some stand-up. And they did a showcase. And uh, Stephen Wright was the most unlikely person. He, he'd only been doing stand-up for a little and he was so different mm -hmm. than anybody else that's ever done that. But that was the thing that really got Peter. And Stephen um, Wright told me just like, I mean, he said that Carson changed his career twice when he won an Oscar for a short film, thanks Johnny. And still every single um, anniversary, every year um, of his Tonight Show debut, calls up Peter LaSalle, the famous Tonight Show producer, and thanks him without fail every year. That Isn't is that how great? grateful, yeah. 
you know what I really love about your podcast is, of course, you've, you've interviewed so many of the biggest stars who were on the show, and that, that's what one would expect. But you have also got myriad talent coordinators and writers and directors and people who, you know, might have been on the show in the last five minutes doing some kind of vaudeville act who we wouldn't necessarily remember all these years later. Yeah. You talk to all of them as well. Why did you want to do that? I, I mean, anybody, these people, everyone has a story and it's sometimes the most unlikely people that have the best stories. But in terms of, of the Carson, the people that worked on the show behind the scenes, it was, it was, it's like hearing how all the magic tricks are done. I mean, it, it was just from like a, from a Copperfield or a Houdini. I mean, there was just so many questions I had and to hear the behind that scenes story and get a real portrait on actually what went on behind the scenes with with getting guests and the, the um, crazy stuff that sometimes went behind the scenes and putting the show together. Um, the, I think that those, the, the listeners, those are their fi the favorite um, episodes. Like the, the, this gentleman, Irving Davis, would hold, hold the curtain open up uh, for Johnny in Burbank. He did it from, for all of Johnny's run for 20 years. And, and he had this, this really, really great relationship with Carson, this friendly relationship that um, some of the other people might be a little bit friendly, but just to hear, hear these stories, um, yes, uh, to, to me, this, t talking to these people has exceeded my, my wildest expectations about who, who Carson was and, and, and what this show really was. Well, I listened to one of your interviews the other day, and um, the fellow said that he was a talent coordinator on the show and that he loved everything about it except his relationship with Ed McMahon. He said he had a falling out with Ed, they never spoke again, and, and you were kind enough not to push that because he said, I don't want to talk about it. Did you ever find out what happened there? It, it's strange. Um, I mean, I've, I've, we've done over a couple hundred hours of this and it's, it's probably the, the one time, maybe two times that anybody said something negative about Ed McMahon. I mean, r routinely, uh, people loved the man. Um, I don't know. I have to go back and figure out who that might have been. I mean, sometimes the, the, the people that worked at the show and the, the, the guests, the famous uh, people, They'll wait till we're done recording. They're like, can I tell you something? I didn't want the <laughs> listeners to know. And I'm just like, sometimes my jaw will drop. Hmm. Um, but yeah, the Ed thing, that, I should look into that. And, um, but yeah, some people are just, and I get it. They, they, they're just closed lip about certain things. But I would love to know what happened. Well, one of the things I often wonder, and I, I spend much of my time talking to politicians, and one does have to take from time to time some of what they say with a grain of salt. And, you know, it... it, it it might be in the interest of some of the people you interview to more closely associate themselves with Johnny Carson and to claim that they actually had more of a relationship than they actually did. How do you know that you're getting the straight goods from these folks? Because I, Mark, this just in, people in showbiz sometimes fudge. <laughs> I, I know, I, I see their bios and they'll say things to me that I'm like, this is simply not true. I've been on Carson 24 times and I'm like, you were on eight times and all, that, that's true. The people that were, were friends with him, um, the one person, his name was Howard Smith. Um, I, I talked to people that, that really, really, really knew Johnny that worked on the show. And they, they, the, um, one of them said, no, he's just Johnny's good friend. And, and, um, the, and I talked to other people within Malibu where he, he lived and stuff. And it, they, they backed up the story. But there was this one guy, I don't want to get into details. Um, Pert, he claimed to be very good friends with Carson, and I do believe for um, a couple years he he probably was. He um, had a relationship with Johnny, taught Johnny uh, his tennis instructor. But then the episode just got really, really strange. Where I could not tell if he was making it up because, and, and the listeners couldn't either. It was one of those things. Did this really, re really happen? And it took um, it took some investigating um, to 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 find out. Um, that that um, his later claims uh, were not true. And what I did is I, I apologized on air. I took the episode down. But th that, that, that definitely um, is the one that happened that I just, I felt really, really bad about. Um, and then, um, but everybody else, I just, I try to do my, I'm not a, a, a journalist by any means, but I definitely, um, if somebody says something, tried to go around and get and fact check to, to make sure that these things or, or real. Like, for example, Diane Cannon, the actress, she would have, Carson would be over for parties and he would bring his drum kit and he'd be playing the drums. Dudley Moore would be on the piano. And, and this was Carson. If he felt comfortable, it was like this, this fun time. And uh, there's people that, 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 um, that say that that absolutely 100% happened. And I have no reason to think someone like a Diane Cannon, because they were very close. 
Um, I mean, he on air, he said, um, she said, you know, when my marriage uh, just ended, you were the first phone call. Um, can Alex and I, Carson's wife, take you out? And um, that he, she, he, she basically said Carson was always there for her. Um, they flirted like, like crazy that. on the air. Yeah, it was fun. Carson um, definitely would do that um, with guests. There would be um, sometimes um, there would be something there. But um, and he did. He, it was he did date her at, at one point. He dated Angie Dickinson for a little mm-hmm. bit. He definitely would go on uh, on dates. I, Sally Field has talked about it. So um, yeah, it's kind of like the Larry Sanders show with Gary Shanley and how sometimes he would go out with some of the uh, fictional, he would go out with some of the guests. You don't really see that at least publicly n- nowadays, but back then, um, yeah. I mean, at Carson, I mean, middle America cities, it doesn't matter. I mean, um, the, uh, it's been said the men wanted to be Johnny and, and um, the, the ladies one wanted to uh, be his girlfriend or his, his wife mm-hmm. or have a relationship with him or attracted him. I mean, he had that charisma where he, he transcended um, pretty much anything, any audience. Well, you introduced me to, uh, on one of your podcasts, which I listened to the other day, to a singer named Donna Theodore, who I must confess I'd never heard of before. Yeah. Uh, she did the show, I guess, back in the 60s when it was in New York at first and then, and then mm-hmm. later in California That's as true. well. And, and I, I went online, I'd never heard of her, so I went online and I saw pictures of her from back in the day and, and oh my God, she was stunning. And... You have her telling the story of Johnny saying to her, I have to be careful around you. You are a dangerous woman for me, which raised the question of, of you know, Johnny had four marriages and they all broke up. So we know that, um, you know, fidelity was a bit of an issue for him. Do you have a sense about how often Johnny tried to score with one of the beautiful female guests that would have been on his show? In between marriages, I'm sure it was more and during um, things, I'm, I'm sure it happened as well. But if you, if you go back to the time, especially during this time period, I mean, Ed McMahon had th- four wives, or three wives. Bobby Quinn, the director, who's Johnny's pal, four wives. Doc, four wives. Carson, I mean, it was uh, definitely, uh, especially back then, uh, a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm sure st- stuff still goes on, but not, maybe not quite like that. But um, yeah, there were definitely um, some guests that I'm sure um, maybe Johnny would, um, there's actually one person who, who I does, who doesn't want to talk to me that, that told me, uh, that they actually were in, um, a relationship with Carson very short while oh, he name, was name, married. Name, name. I don't even know if you know who the person is, but this person definitely has a following. And, um, yeah, I'm always surprised when people, like, we stop, we, yeah, like, um, I'm always surprised when people will tell me some of these things because it's definitely, I don't ask. I, I really don't. I mean, if you notice, the, there's not a lot of gossip. Like, I ask questions, but if there's anything that comes off too gossipy, I'm very careful, and sometimes I'll take this stuff out. But uh, Well, it's interesting. You say, Mark, you actually just told me a few minutes ago, you say, I'm not a journalist, but, but I'll tell you what. Um, you do your homework. You definitely do your research. You ask good questions, good, neutral, lean, open-ended questions. You don't go for those sort of gotcha moments. I got to say that you're, I mean, I think you do a very fine job. But, but it did make me wonder, what, what do you really do for a living? Because I can't imagine you make a living at this. Oh, you're so nice uh, to ask. Yeah, I mean, definitely with the podcast, I do make um, some income. But um, if somebody Googles my name, they'll see that I've, I've been on a lot of TV shows. I, um, I, I used to do a lot of comedy videos, stunt comedy videos. So I'd go on an- with Anderson Cooper on the Today Show, Good Morning America. I did that for many, many years where I do stuff like I lived on an airplane for a month to get over my fear of flying and I was compensated for it. So I do all this video content. Like I lived in Ikea for a week. I did that with Ikea. It was, it was global news. This was 10 years ago or something like that. So um, I do that. And then uh, these days I'm developing a kid's comedy show that I've been work, workshopping for a long time, um, working on the podcast and just a bunch of different things. I'm, I'm actually producing uh, and I'll tell you something, I'm producing something about Late Night, which I can tell you when, when we're done um, right now, but um, it's almost over. But um, yeah, I just do things here and there. And um, occasionally I'll still get hired to be on camera. Hmm. Well, I have to say, you've made a tremendous contribution, I think, to understanding how Late Night worked back in the day. And, you know, I can understand why somebody might want to do a couple of dozen episodes on that. But as you say, you're approaching 300 episodes, and these are hour long episodes, and you can tell there's a lot of work that goes into them. Why do you do it? First of all, some of them are two hours. Some of them are 
have been over two hours. I, I do it out of pure curiosity. I, I really thought I'd, I'd do 10 episodes. And according to Joan Rivers and Bushkin, I thought I, I, my biggest thing, fear, my biggest hesitation was like, I thought everyone would be negative, say everything negative about Johnny, which is not even close to the case. I mean, people really, really liked him. He was aloof, he was shy, yes. But the stories that have come out about him um, being such a good friend of people and the generosity, it's incredible. So for me personally, it, it, it's just learning. Uh, it's just, I, I do look at it as just a curiosity. Like I, I do feel approaching 300, I've gotten um, nearly all my questions answered about what went on at the Tonight Show and, and him. Because I mean, how does somebody, because, is, how is somebody the most famous man in America and so little is known about them? I mean, Carson would give interviews once in a while, didn't like to do the interviews, but was very tight-lipped. So it was one of those things for a, 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 an iconic figure that had nothing um, ab about them, very little. Um, it was just um, it was just pure curiosity. And I, and I, I still do enjoy it. I'm recording one uh, later today. Actually, do you want to mention who you're talking to later <laughs> today? <laughs> and it would be your Aunt Myra. That's right. And that's funny because she was on my list of people to talk to. And you sent me the nice email that I still can't believe that you got to go to the show in New York when you were way below uh, the, the age of 16 where you had to be. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. And you mentioned um, your aunt and I asked who, who she was. And I said, oh, my goodness. Yeah, she's on my list. So uh, behold, today I'm talking to her. I, I, and I can't wait to hear that episode. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, we should fill in the blanks here for those who, who don't understand the connection here. My aunt Myra Richmond. Myra Pakin Richmond, my father's sister, uh, was a talent booker for the Carson Show in New York back in the 1960s. And I remember being a child of 10, being invited wow. to go. And I wasn't allowed in the audience, but I sat back behind one-way glass at the very back with my parents and watched the Carson Show. Uh, I guess it was 1970 uh, in New York City. And wow. then, uh, and then my, my aunt moved to California and I went to visit her numerous times. And I think she took me at least once, maybe twice more to see uh, the Carson show in Burbank. And I think I saw it four times altogether. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, it, it was it, an unforgettable experience. I want to know from you, though, did you ever meet him? No, I didn't. I, I mean, Doc is the only connection. I, I almost, it's a long story. I almost met Ed. And um, yeah, I never met the guy. I mean, he was so private. And um, I think about it sometimes, like maybe I, I should have um, cause I wrote him a letter when I was a kid and got back like a, like a standard, like a pre-signed thing. And I didn't really think that he would read his mail in retirement, but according to his assistant, he, he read everything. <laughs> and I think I might've been able to make a decent case by having um, a lunch when I was like 16, 17 or 18, something like that. But, uh, not meant to be, but he what does. What a shame. I, cause you, yeah. you, you probably know him better than anybody in the world right now. It's very strange about, um, I don't think about it, but it's definitely got it in my consciousness, my subconsciousness. He shows up in my dreams, like maybe <laughs> once every other week. And I'm like, Johnny, what are you doing in my dream? <laughs> well, I do. Uh, go ahead. I, I do want to mention um, The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. Jerry Seinfeld, just so, for younger people, just so you know, Jerry Seinfeld said, was staying up and watching, it was an event. 12, 1130 to 1230. Carson and it, it really was I mean you couldn't watch it any of the, the next day unless you videotaped it and uh, for a long time VCRs weren't accessible and then people would stay up at, at 12 30 to watch Dave Letterman from 12 30 to 1 30 and Seinfeld so that was event and then this other guy Bob Costas who people know as a sports caster had then a show called later for a long time so I mean this was a huge thing that people would stay up and it was it was like a sports event for them I agree. I remember all that well. And Tom Snyder as well, who used to fire yes. up the color teeny. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's a fascinating guy. Really, really fascinating, Tom Snyder. Mm -hmm. I wish I, I could do more on him. I have, one, I have one little Johnny story that I want to share with you. Oh, which please. Is, uh, once upon a time, I managed through a series of events that I don't have to get into here. I managed to get one of the mugs that Johnny kept on his desk. Wow. And, and it was an autographed mug. And Ed McMahon came through Toronto probably 20, 25 years ago on a book tour. And I thought to myself, you know what? I want to bring this mug and show Ed and, and find out, you know, is this, is this a legitimate thing? Because I got it from somebody from whom it should have, you know, there should have been no question as to its provenance. So I 
took the, as I'm doing the book interview with Ed McMahon and after it's over, I said, listen, I want to show you this mug here. And I, I said, like, I, this can't be the mug Johnny had on his desk, right? And he looked at it and he said, well, that is his signature and that is his mug, but it's not the only mug of that type. He had a lot of mugs like that. There are a lot of them out there with his, his signature on them. And then he pulled a Sharpie out of his breast pocket and he said, but this will be the only one with Johnny's signature and mine as well. And he signed the mug and of course I still have it and it's one of my fondest keepsakes. And I just thought that was an awfully lovely moment, uh, which I hope I'll never forget. That is very cool. And just to let the listeners know, they never sold the mugs. I mean, they were made at this no. place called the Burbank Mug Shop. And um, I can tell by looking at them if they're real or not. There's some, facim- um, some, some ones that aren't real that have been out uh, on the market a few times. And they're pr- pretty easy to tell they're, they're not real. But um, yeah, to get, those, to get those mugs, I mean, you said there are a lot. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I have people all, like, people have asked. And I mean, sometimes they'll be on sale on eBay sometimes. But I, I definitely they're a prized possession to even get one, but let alone to have them signed uh, by, by the two of them. That's, a, that's amazing. And that'll never end up on eBay. And I got it incidentally from Martin. Boy, this sounds like terrible name dropping, but Martin Short and I are from the same hometown, Hamilton, Oh, Ontario. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got yeah. it from him, actually. Yeah, he was on with Carson like three or four times, and they played poker. Uh, he played um, in Johnny's poker game at least once. I, I've asked him to be on, and... For some reason, he he um is not doesn't do podcasts, or if he does, it has to be like good friends and stuff. But um, hey, I um I, I I've met him before. Really nice guy. I mean, oh, yeah. extremely talented. But Absolutely. I would like for him to be a guest. I'll, I'll I'll send him an email. Let's see what happens. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, who knows? I want to finish off this interview in the same way that you finish off all of your podcast oh, interviews, wow. which is to say. I'll ask the big question. Who was Johnny Carson and what did he mean to you? I deserve this because I've asked this hundreds of times to yes, other people. Have. Um, Johnny Carson was a cultural icon that was really a voice of America for 30 years. When, when people, when this, things were uh, turbulent in, in, in America through different events, they would turn to, to Carson for, for humor. He, he had an ability... Um, what was going on with politics to, uh, to, to, to joke about the politicians and set kind of the tone of how the public would, would see a, a Richard Nixon um, or um, like he went after um, Dan Quayle, who was vice president for a while, but he did it in a way where it wasn't mean spirited. I'm not saying this stuff now today isn't, but he they definitely had, had um, the pulse of America of like what other people were thinking and he played left he played right he played to everyone you never knew what the guy's politics was so you had everybody that would just tune into this guy to get his take on on, on what happened I and mean, he he changed people's careers he, he he was someone that was born to do this I mean it is very hard to get behind that desk and to have the skill set a lot of famous comedians can't can't do it but he was born to do the show he put all his energy into the show, which is why probably he didn't have the greatest relationship with his kids and w- w- with his wives. And he was just that this generosity, I mean, just oozed. I mean, when, when, when he, um, he, he would do this stuff anonymously. And then when he uh, finally um, uh, died, it was revealed that it was $180 million foundation. And it's mm-hmm. been uh, every year gives so much out to people. And he was doing this before it as well, but didn't want anyone to know it. And Doc Severinsen and a lot of people I've talked to on the car uh, that worked there said they the classy class that was the, a way that people uh, described it and he was very very I think smart to get out of the game uh, when he left the Tonight Show in 92 as much as I would have liked for him to come back his 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 thing he said a lot to people stay or a lot of people stay like Bob Hope around way too long um, I've, I've done it 30 years, I'm never going to be able to top that. And he let the work speak for himself, which I, I think is, is, was uh, a really great thing that he could just walk away from, from the crowd and just all like the cheer and stuff and just let the body of work speak for itself. Well, speaking of which, your body of work really does speak for itself as well. You've done great work. I hope you keep going because it, it's truly one of my very favorite podcasts. And it's been a delight to get to know you a little bit and talk with you here today. Thanks so much. Oh, Steve, this was so much fun. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for asking me to, to be on it. From, from a broadcaster, from somebody of, of your stature, it's a huge compliment. When I got your email, I, got, I was excited. I showed my wife, Christine. And um, yeah, I really, really appreciate you having me on. You're too kind. Be well. Be well. See ya.